Hello, my name is John E. Stith. I'm going to spend some time today telling you about some of my favorite science fiction books, telling you a bit about my own science fiction books, and reading you an excerpt from an upcoming novella in Amazing Stories called Tiny Time Machine. One of my older favorites from the A's is by Brian Aldiss called Starship. It was originally called Nonstop, uh, retitled Starship in the U.S., which gives away the some of the plot, which I'm going to also give away since it's written in the 50s. But it's a generation ship story uh, in uh, probably my first exposure to generation ships. And they, folks have been aboard long enough, we don't realize at first that they're on a generation ship. We only gradually discover that in the course of the story. But it's a lot of fun. My second A author today is Richard Adams, who wrote Watership Down, which is well enough known that it doesn't need my recommendation for it. But uh, but it's a wonderful book, you know, populated with a cast of rabbits. And uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, you really should. My first B author book is uh, fairly obscure, The Stars Are Too High by Agnew Banson. In it, their world tensions are at a high, which <laughs> they seem to have been as long as I've been alive. And our group of heroes decide to fix that by creating a common enemy to fake a, an alien presence on the earth. And things go wrong, as they do. My second B author is much better known, although not a household name by any means. Frederick Brown wrote maybe more than a hundred wonderful short stories uh, collected in uh, From These Ashes, the complete short science fiction of Frederick Brown. Uh, he also wrote a number of uh, very entertaining novels called The Mind Thing and The Rogue from Space. My first C author is Orson Scott Card, who wrote Ender's Game, which if you follow science fiction at all, you're probably, you've probably read it or you're probably aware of it. But if you haven't, check it out. It's a wonderful book and the sequels are, are terrific. My second C author in this thumbnail wrap up is Hal Clement, who wrote Needle one of my all-time favorite science fiction mysteries in which a teenage boy has to work with uh, an, an alien who's arrived here in search of a, of a bad guy alien. And it's a lot of fun. My own work includes Redshift Rendezvous, which was a Nebula finalist. It's set in hyperspace in a strange environment where the speed of light is 10 meters per second. So relativistic effects occur at observable speeds. You can run and create a sonic boom. And against that back backdrop, we have a hyperspace starship hijacking. Another one of my books is Manhattan Transfer, which starts with the kidnapping of Manhattan in its entirety, where the residents find themselves under a dome in an enormous starship and through the glass they see hundreds of other alien cities and so their job is to figure out why they're there and get the hell out of there. My most recent novel was Pushback, a mystery suspense novel that was a finalist for the Daphne du Maurier Award for Excellence in Mystery Suspense. In it, a, an investment counselor goes to his 10-year high school reunion and discovers that he doesn't know one person there and also soon discovers that someone is out to kill him and he needs to find out who and why and survive. And now here's an excerpt from Tiny Time Machine. The narrator, Meg, is a 16-year-old girl. 
My dad and I were in one of our many non-speaking periods when he conducted his first truly successful portal test. I only found this out after the fact, and it wasn't because I talked to him. I would do anything if I could talk to him again, but that ship has sunk to the bottom. I learned this from the recordings I found after his death. My dad, Frederick Vantage, was conducting what he called portal test number five. As it had before, the portal snapped open between a brick-walled lined alley here in our San Francisco and the corresponding location in the other San Francisco. But this time was different. This time the portal stayed open for more than a second. Some people measure success in millions. Dad measured his in seconds. The portal itself was a simple rectangle about the median size of an ordinary window in a typical house. The bottom was roughly level with Dad's belt and the top about even with his receding hairline. Dad had been partly prepared for the possibility of a staple portal. He took a couple of quick pictures, noting with surprise that while his San Francisco was overcast and cool on that day, the other San Francisco was hot, dry, dusty. But something else made an even bigger impression. Not a meter away lay a dead body, fairly badly decomposed. A man, apparently, in work clothes and worn brown shoes. Near one of his feet was an empty beer bottle. Deeper in the alley, another body lay crumpled on the ground. While Dad was hoping for a stable portal, his preparations were not completely thought out. Quickly, he extended a pair of fireplace tongs through the portal and toward the bottle. He was obviously nervous about extending his arm through the portal, not totally certain of how long it would stay open. The tongs were an awkward tool for picking up a bottle lying at an angle, and haste makes fumbles. His anger went from zero to rage in two seconds. Come on, come on, oh for... The tongs touched the bottle but just managed to roll it farther away. Simultaneously, his warning timer started up. Don't do this to me, you son of a... He decided correctly, and luckily for him, that he couldn't risk any more time. He drew back, his hands grasping the handles of the tongs, retreated through the portal. The tongs themselves were about halfway through when the beep stopped and the portal closed. His hands instantly rose and the ends of the tongs climbed in a corresponding arc as if he were skeet shooting. The tongs had just lost half their weight as the closing portal severed them cleanly. In the other San Francisco, the loose ends must have clanked as they hit the alley pavement. If he had been competing for stringing together cuss words, he would have easily made the nationals. Maybe the internationals. I didn't know any of this at the time, of course. I hadn't spoken to Dad since our most recent blow-up, our last, as it turned out. I wasn't even out of high school yet, and he had gone off about me not making enough of my life, about me not realizing my potential. It was like he thought I should already have my first Nobel Prize. I was less than deferential, more than ready to be confrontational, and suddenly we were once again immersed in scorched earth yelling and pulse-pounding anger. Darn it, Dad. So I'm an angry scientist's daughter, not a mad scientist's daughter. Maybe in the future, if the dictionary police keep legalizing common errors, mad will no longer mean crazy and instead it will be nothing more than just another superfluous synonym for angry. But to many, mad still means crazy, and my dad wasn't crazy. He just had anger issues. And too often, like father, like daughter. Darn it, dad. 
Some people are repelled by bad example parents and gravitate toward the polar opposite. Some are blinded by their parents' shining path and they can't see any alternative trail. Then there's us. We are disgusted with our parents' selected course, but try as we may, we drift into the same orbit. Sometimes though, the things you least expect can kick you right out of your trajectory. Or they can just kick you in the butt. Sometimes you don't know the difference until later. Late in the evening, a couple of days later, I was studiously engaged in not speaking to my dad and doing a fine job of it, if I do say so myself. I was instead cutting through the bottom half meter of a chain link fence. Ironic, right? Here I helped build this huge fence between me and my dad and now I was tearing down someone else's fence. But it was for a good cause. It's not as easy as you think. If you go large, then yes, the links are easy to cut, but then you have the enormous set of cutters to deal with. They cost money, and the handles are so long, you pretty much have to leave them at the entry point and hope you depart the same way. And you have to hope you're not running so fast that you can't find the cutter, says you scramble past. Or you could be leaving the premises in the back of a police car. That's where I met Josh Underhill, but I'm getting ahead of myself. If you go too small, then for one thing it takes Bigfoot strength. And at 16, I'm a lot closer to Robin than Batman. For another, the sound is analogous to clipping your nails in class. That high-pitched snip sound carries like a belch at a piano recital. I'd gone too small once and not even gotten past the fence. The closest I'd gotten to going too big was looking at a giant pair of cutters in a hardware store. The guy in the time machine could have cut through the Morlock's front door with that baby. So that night, I was snipping my way from the ground up by using slightly oversized cutters, one small enough to fit in a coat pocket, but large enough to get the job done. The fence surrounded You Little Pest, a hideous pest control company just off 101 in San Francisco. The trucks in the parking lot showed huge pictures of beetles and cockroaches and mice, all with their feet in the air. In case anyone thought maybe they were playing, like a circus seal with a ball, they had X's over their eyes. The illustration stopped short of adding more universal symbols for death, like tongues hanging out of their mouths or hands clutching at hearts. What the graphics didn't show were huge canisters of deadly poison. Snip, snip, two more links. Seconds later, I slipped through the gap my green recycled t-shirt clung to my body and nothing snagged on the way through. By comparing notes with Josh after we met and got acquainted, I know that while I was busily destroying private property, Josh was hiding in the main building concealed inside a closet until it was safe to come out. He gave me a more flattering view of what went down, but I can put two and two together. The closet doorknob turned and rattled, and the door stayed shut. Then, whomp, Josh put his shoulder into the door, hard, still stuck. Damn it! He was lucky no one was in the office to hear him. He crashed his shoulder into the door a couple more times. Finally, it sprang open and crashed into a desk. He was no doubt massaging his shoulder as he listened for signs of discovery. None. Josh, too, was closer to Robin than Batman, but that's okay. He's 17 and still has some time to increase his muscle mass, if he wants to. He hauled his backpack out of the closet and headed down the hall toward the office bullpen. I was on the move at the same time, getting closer to the feet of poison mobiles. The vehicles all had, you little pest, in enormous letters. 
Someone had told me that was a reference to W.C. Fields or the Three Stooges or some old black and white movie era act. It was almost midnight. The air was moist and cold, but I still felt warm. I wondered if that feeling of warmth would carry over to a cold and damp jail cell if I were caught. One of my mailing tubes wrapped against the side of the nearest truck and I stood stock still, listening for trouble. Lucky I did, because only seconds later, I spotted a roving security guard and pulled back around the corner of the truck. As I waited for the guard to move on, Josh would have been inside the building, setting his stuff down on an office chair in the bullpen. This looks like a great spot for you little buddies, he said as he unzipped his backpack and pulled out a large canister. He twisted off the lid. Josh started shaking out the contents onto the desktop. A dark mass covered the light desktop and in seconds the stuff started spreading on its own. The thousands of cockroaches started fleeing in every direction. Hey little buddies, make yourself at home. In the parking lot, I was busily taking posters out of my mailing tube, spraying contact cement on the truck walls, and slapping posters onto the trucks. The posters showed horrible pictures of dead cats and dogs with warnings like, poisoning rats is poisoning the food chain, and when your cat eats a poisoned rat, who dies next? Josh had pulled out some posters too, his said, trap and release, don't maim and kill. Even cockroaches are life. I really don't know who they spotted first, but one moment all seemed calm and under control, and the next, the air was filled with multiple klaxon horns, all sounding like prison movie escapes. I ran like the Nazis were after me. Josh shoved the canister into his backpack and took a couple of fast steps crunchy steps. I can only imagine how horrible that would feel and sound. He was walking on cockroaches. Oh crap, sorry guys. He had little choice. He kept moving toward the exit. Another crunchy step. Oh, sorry, crunch. Sorry, crunch. Sorry. Josh exited the office and headed down a dimly lit hallway, moving as fast as he could. He got to the intersection, skidded into a fast turn, and ran right into a side of beef. Actually, it was a security guard with the build of a linebacker who no longer had to watch his weight. Sorry, can you tell me where the men's... Josh's words were cut off as the guy grabbed him by the neck and squeezed. At the same time, I was nearly out of breath from the running and the excitement of the chase. Excitement? Ha! The terror of the chase. As I raced between two trucks, a security guard blocked the way ahead. I used all the friction my sneakers could apply, stopped, and headed back the way I had come from. Well, that lasted about two seconds. Another security guard appeared right in front of me, and I was boxed in. He gave me an arrogant smile and said, Hey, sweetie, how's it going? I should have gone quietly, but I was angry. That happens. I tried to evade them and almost made it, but they grabbed me more roughly than they needed to, and a lot more intimately than they needed to. Bastards. When things calmed down slightly, I was woman-handled towards some blue and red flashing lights. Along the side of the parking lot, I was handcuffed behind my back and then shoved into the back seat of a waiting SFPD police car. I was looking out the window, trying to memorize faces in case I had a chance to complain about the girl patrol when I realized I wasn't alone. I turned slowly, and there was Josh on the other side of the back seat, also in handcuffs. He wore a green recycled t-shirt that matched my own. Naturally, we both spoke at the same time, saying the same thing. Who the hell are you? 
And that's the end of the excerpt. So thanks for listening through all of this. If you want to find out more about my work, you can visit my website at www.neverend.com or you can find me on Facebook or Twitter or around. Thanks.